Oh, it says right it says live right now. Awesome. Well, hello everybody. <laughs> Some of us are live. Um, I got. Let me see. I'm not connected to. Okay, not everywhere. Not on LinkedIn. There we go. And. Okay, we're connecting. I'm having all kinds of internet issues, so please forgive us. If you were here last week, I had issues last week. So we're going to make the best of it anyhow. Welcome to Life Talk Burrito with me, Michelle Gunn, and our other co-host, Shreyas Kaushik, and we're welcoming Professor Pete Alexander today. Well, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Shreyas. <laughs> I love technology. <laughs> yeah, I think we have the perfect guest as well uh, to deal with the internet stress we're kind of going through. Uh, on that note, uh, Professor Pete, welcome to the show. It was an insightful episode on the podcast last week. So I'm sure anyone who has listened to that episode will find this equally interesting and probably much more insightful because this is a longer version, unbridged, unscripted, mm -hmm. and we are going to go through each and everything and probably Professor Pete will share some good tools once again. And Professor Pete, I would just want to let you know your episode was a big hit, especially the tool that you provided, the two minute um, meditation exercise has mm -hmm. found great patronage. and. Coincidentally, you just uh, helped us cross 1,000 downloads on our podcast. Wow. So thank you for doing that episode with us. Well, thank and, you for uh, that. Uh, great to hear. So I don't think, uh, I think people are just trying to get hold of you everywhere. You're on Clubhouse, you're on other LinkedIn <laughs> Live, you're <laughs> attending shows after shows. So let us know how you're feeling right now. I'm great. I am. Um... You know, I, I was talking to Michelle before the uh, before we started live. Um, I'm having to apply. Uh, well, hello, Judith. Um, the uh, that uh, the property right next to my house is going to be developed up, so I have to figure out anti-stress stuff for that too. Because when when the pounding and the the chainsaws start and everything like that, the serenity goes away. <laughs> uh, I can definitely attest to that because. Right next to um, my apartment, there are two more big towers coming up, and mm -hmm. it just is very crazy. So since you brought that topic, uh, I'd like to ask a few tips to maintain that calmness and serenity within, and also the way I interact. So what tips do you have for me? Well, for something like that, okay, so obviously we were also talking about having the good headsets because if you can have some noise canceling uh, equipment, that'll help a lot. I won't get rid of it, especially if the big cranes or anything are, are, are happening, but at least it, it lessens it because when um, we have a lot of distractions um, and especially annoying distractions and we just try and you know, try and ignore it, it usually doesn't work. So you have to take some action there. So so having some equipment for that. Um, another thing that uh, really is helpful is I like to call it, uh, don't try and control the uncontrollable because the reality is you have no control. I have no control over the property being developed. So, you know, unless you want to make a you know, a, a big show on TV where you're going to lie down in front of the crane or something like that and get arrested. Um, you know, so you, ha you have to look at it and say, okay, whenever you're dealing with a stressful situation, look at it from two lists. The first list is what you can control. And the second list is what you can't control. Because our human nature is that whenever we're faced with a stressful situation, we tend to worry about all aspects of it. And that takes up all of our mind share. And so if we are able to say, okay, what can we control and what can't we control? And then we say, all right, the things that we can control. So let's say getting some equipment or, or um, maybe 
uh, going to a neighbor's house uh, that has less noise or, or you know, going somewhere, maybe to, to the library where you have to have some quiet time to concentrate. Whatever you can do, that is, a, you know, going to help you because if you focus on what you can control, what happens is when we feel like we're in control and we can affect change, what happens is our stress goes down automatically. But if we spend all of our time worrying about, oh my gosh, it's going to constantly be noisy and, um, or, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 I can't do anything about it. Oh, like this, then we just, our stress automatically goes up. So big, big recommendation is think about what you can control, Shreyas, with that, focus on that. And if you can ignore what you can't control mm -hmm. or reduce the, uh, any of the uh, watching the, or, or paying any attention to that, you'll be a lot less stressed. Yeah, one of my stress relievers just joined us, at least by tail. So I pulled him down because <laughs> they love to crawl on your computers, but uh, yep. he yep. definitely wants to be a part of things today. So dealing with the stress a little bit pull them on my lap and I can pet them and relax. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that'll help my internet stability also. <laughs> there you go. And, and pets, pets are an oh, awesome yeah. stress reliever. Is they it really just me or is... What, what, what happened? Prof's feet uh, is I, frozen can you... Michelle, on your hand as well. He looks fine to me. Yeah, I can hear you just okay. fine. So we're going to share in the troubles today. So that I just not one person is stressed. Anyway, well, everybody can hear me. Um, anybody mm -hmm. who's participating, please go ahead and leave a comment of where you're tuning in from. And if you have any questions, particularly related to stress, Professor Pete's here now live to answer those. So drop them in the comments. And we're very grateful to welcome anybody who shows up and participates. Absolutely. Um, so as we let the audience warm up, uh, Professor Pete, uh, you have talked about this on the podcast very briefly, but I'd want you to just elaborate a little bit in depth about your struggles with stress management and mm -hmm. the way you cope up and what eventually led you to create those tools. Sure. Um, well, stress and I have had a long history together. Um, it goes from my dysfunctional childhood. Um, but where I started documenting it in my mind was back in 2008. And um, back then, uh, it was like a perfect storm of stressful activities that were going on. My uh, my dad was passing away and and in hospice, and he had to have all of his affairs taken care of. My mom had major uh, uh, hip surgery, and she didn't have the insurance to help her with the physical therapy after the surgery. Uh, I was running my business and had to you know take care of everything with all the employees. <clears throat> um, my kids were really young and wanted my attention. And, uh, oh, and my, my marriage was heading for a divorce. So all these things were just piling on. And um, I was diagnosed with stress-induced diabetes. And this is the crazy part. I didn't listen to my body about what stress was doing to it. Instead, what I did was I continued, as an entrepreneur does, you know, burning the candle at both ends for 10 more years until I ended up in the emergency room uh, an hour before being comatose, according to the doctors, with a severe case of diabetic ketoacidosis. And what, for the visitors who may not know what that is, my body was eating itself alive because of my stress. And the crazy thing is, uh, you know, I, I, the, uh, they admitted me Im immediately. I think they thought I was having a heart attack at first because uh, I, I was kind of green color. Um, my glucose numbers were so high that the medical grade glucometer couldn't read it. So they estimated that it was eight to 10 times higher than normal. And I took in, I was so dehydrated, I took in. 
uh, six liters of fluid in the first hour and a half. The um, and and I was so stressed out because I was working on this really important project and it was very high profile. I was working for a medical device company at that time. And uh, it was just, it was constantly on my mind. <clears throat> well, they, from the emergency room, they transferred me to the ICU and it's the only time I'd ever been in ICU and I had to spend uh, several days in the ICU. And on my second day at about 6 a.m., I get a text from my boss. And my boss says, you have a webinar you need to run at eight o'clock. What are you going to do about it? And mind you, my boss knew that I was in the ICU. And so there I am, I grab my phone and I start trying to reschedule this webinar. And the nurse who was on, uh, on call at that point, they were checking my blood every half an hour. And my, my numbers had come back down into at least more reasonable. They were still high, but they were more reasonable. And she takes my blood while I'm trying to reschedule this webinar. And my numbers skyrocketed back up, just like a 90 degree angle. And she just says a matter of factly to me, she says, you realize that's what puts you in this hospital bed in the first place. And that was the epiphany moment that I needed. A complete stranger tells me this and I'm thinking, what am I doing? I'm trading my health for my career. And that is a very bad trade. So um, I went ahead, uh, it was a couple more days and I got out of the ICU. I spent, spent those next couple of days primarily just focusing on what do I need to do? And, um, and then when I got out, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to resign. I got to focus on my health. And so I resigned from my job. I started focusing on any kind of stress relief tool or technique that I could find. And a lot of them worked, some of them didn't. But what happened was after I started applying these, not only did my stress go down, but my glucose numbers as a diabetic went down, my weight went down, and my energy level went way, way up. It was like I was experiencing the fountain of youth. And if you look at me now and you look at pictures of me 13 years ago when I first got the stress-induced diabetes, I actually look younger today, which is crazy. It is crazy. Um, and so my friends, family, you know, former coworkers and stuff, they said, you ought to write a book about this. And so I, I decided to write the book and, you know, and knowing that there's not a lot of time, people don't have a lot of time to spend like, let's say a 300 page book on meditation, for example. The reality is most of us have five minutes or less where we are going to go into a you know, a stressful meeting or a presentation we have to give or what, what, maybe a discussion we have to have with somebody and got to try something. And so that's what I, I offered up. And it was a very successful book on, on Amazon. And, uh, and I just started helping others uh, with this as well, with the intent that, you know, if you can, even if you can find one technique that you can use on a daily basis for one to two minutes, the compound benefits over time will be enormous, but you have to start today. You can't procrastinate. And the reality is too, is if you find something, you try it for a minute or two and it doesn't work for you, big deal. Try something else. You only spend a minute or two, but once you find that thing that works for you, you run with it. And that is a very detailed explanation. So if I were to summarize for those who have just joined us, the question that was posed was to understand Professor Pete's struggles with stress and what prompted him to come up with these magnificent tools that he's been sharing for quite some time. So his biggest challenge was that he was sacrificing health for his full-time job and also about uh, he had troubles with the relationship, his parents were going through a tough time which directly impacted the levels of stress Professor Pete was facing. 
And his biggest breakthrough came when a nurse at the hospital he was admitted to apparently asked him or brought his awareness to the fact that he was ignoring his health, which put him in that tough situation. So it, it really is inspiring. And when we hear these experiences about people going to stress the way they come out, I think it really does motivate others. And we do hope in the next uh, 30 minutes to help you have that great starting point and also just uh, let you decide for yourself how best you'd want to come out of stress and how soon. So it is your conscious choice to let go of stress. Uh, on that note, Professor Pete, uh, I'm really curious what were the sources that you started looking at when you decided it stress was enough and you wanted to come out of it? The source, so like what was causing me the stress? Um, rather, yes, that would help as well. But mm -hmm. uh, I'd really want to understand what were the sources you first started looking at to oh. get some tips because I'm sure when it happened for you, probably LinkedIn was not as established as it is right now. Mm -hmm. So I think you were, what were your go-to source when you started feeling that it was time you'd kick the stress out of your system? So I did what probably most people would do. I Googled it. <laughs> I just started looking and, you know, and I'd find these different techniques and I think, okay, let me give this a try. So a lot of them came, uh, sent me to YouTube videos. Um, some of them sent me to blog posts. Some of them were uh, just articles that I would read. And um, so what I would do is I would try them. Each one of them, I would try them and I would just see, did that work for me? Did that not? And so I started keeping track on a spreadsheet of the things that worked and the things that didn't work. And the interesting thing was, is I was thinking, okay, I'm just going to focus on the stuff that works. Well, as I found out, as I was starting to um, really get into this more, it's interesting because a particular technique that works for me may not work for you, Shreyas, or may not work for you, Michelle, or vice versa. And so it's not about, you know, finding the ultimate thing that works for everybody because they're not. There's, it's just not going to be there. Like, for example, you, you'll find a lot of information on meditation. There's just some people where meditation doesn't work. And for me, for many years, I found that it didn't work. But then, you know, as I continued to try different techniques on that, I found, okay, let me try this. Let me try this type of meditation or that type of meditation. And then uh, what really helped with, with the meditation, for example, for me, was that I stopped criticizing myself about whether or not I was doing it right. That's one of the problems that a lot of us do have our inner critic. We listen to our inner critic and our inner critic says, oh, you have to do this exactly right. And if you don't do it exactly right, then you're not doing it correctly. So for example, um, in meditation, if your mind is wandering and you think, oh, I, it needs to be calm, it needs to be quiet, I, I, I need to be repeating a mantra, yeah, of course, that would be ultimately where you want to be. But the bottom line is your mind needs to let go of those thoughts. It's stressed by those thoughts. So if part of your meditation is just letting those, those thoughts wander and get out of your head, that alone means that the meditation is working because you just have to tell yourself, it doesn't matter, just go ahead and stay calm, quiet for whatever time it is that you're going to make it, and you'll get what you need out of it. Don't criticize it. Don't evaluate it. Just go with it. And that's that's part of, a, you know, part of what I, I do now. And, you know, there's a lot of times I'll do a meditation in the morning and I'll do meditation in the uh, evening. And uh, depending on how my day went, um, will be a completely different type of meditation. Awesome. I want to go back just a little bit because uh, I think the example that you gave, how you figured out stress was causing you such great health issues was a mm -hmm. very severe case, or at least it ended up to be a severe case. Mm -hmm. I know I have experienced um, 
hives, full body hives from stress. Mm -hmm. And of course, immediately don't connect that it was stress related, except that I had to figure out how I got hives. So the body usually starts sending you signals before it gets to that bad. So what kinds of things should people look for in the beginning stages where stress is starting to really affect them physically? You know, that it's, it's a really great point there, Michelle. So from, if you think about it, um, there's, our stress is going to be there both mentally and physically mentally it might be a lack of concentration um, instead of you being able to focus. Uh, another early early sign might be you might start getting mood swings where you go happy to sad or angry at a moment's notice. Uh, maybe you're starting to get panic attacks or anxiety over something in the future that may or may not happen. Um, some of us may have prescription drug or alcohol addiction, and that is a sign that you're mentally stressed. Physically, your body's going to give you early signs, as you said, for sure. Um, frequent colds, like let's say having a cold every month uh, instead of uh, once, a, once a season, that's an indicator. Uh, probably the earliest sign is uh, back and shoulder stiffness because, you know, when we're stressed, and we're sitting at a desk, we tend to hunch over when we're stressed. And uh, so we're not sitting ergonomically. And so that'll, that'll start tightening up. Uh, you might have either excessive or not enough sleep uh, versus what you normally would have. That's an indicator that you're physically stressed. Um, digestive disorders where no, no, no amount of Pepto-Bismol is helping you, or you're reaching for the Excedrin bottle every day or every other day instead of occasionally um, because you're getting constant headaches. Um, and then for me, a really huge sign was a weight, weight fluctuations. And this can go either gaining weight or losing weight rapidly. When I got diagnosed with stress induced diabetes for four and a half weeks before I got my diagnosis, I lost 30 pounds in less than 30 days. And at first, I thought, this is fantastic. I, uh, I was in my mid-40s, and I thought, wow, you know, I, I, I'm not doing any special exercise. I'm just doing my normal exercise. I'm not doing any diet, so I'm eating whatever I want. And I'm, the weight kept on coming off. And after it hit that 30th pound, then I went uh, to get some blood work done. And sure enough, stress-induced diabetes. But there's so many times where I, if I would have listened to my body or listened, you know, realized why am I not being able to focus and stuff, I would have been able to take action. But unfortunately, we tend to, you know, put it aside and just say that is what it is. And you know, one of the things that I like to, 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 to mention to people is that it's not that we have to um, avoid all stress. That's not, not what we need to do because there's good stress and then there's bad stress. Good stress, uh, it's also called eustress, um, that helps us get things done. You know, so if we have a particular project that we need to get done, on work that we love. So let's say we're working at doing something that we love or an activity that we love and we need to get something done. Yeah, we're going to get stressed, but that's good stress. It's not going to have um, negative effects on our body or our mind. It get, helps us get things done on time. What we want to do is avoid negative stress. And negative stress comes really in two flavors. Uh, one is rumination, and that's where we're worrying about stuff that happened in the past. So we have some guilt about something we did or didn't do. The reality is we can't control or do anything about the past. It's done. So take the learnings from that, but don't wallow in the past. So that's one negative stress. And the other one is anxiety about future events because if we're worried about something happening in the future where that may or may not happen, 
if we constantly are thinking, oh, it's going to be a bad outcome, it's going to be a bad outcome, it's going to be a bad outcome, what ends up happening? Chances are it's going to be a bad outcome. And that's because we manifested that. So I always recommend just cut out the rumination of the past and the anxiety of the future. And you're going to be way better for it just if you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. You made a very good point, which is around losing weight. So many people would tend to ignore. And even if it was me, I would be very happy that I'm losing weight without any workouts or and at the same time, having all the food that I really crave for. Mm -hmm. So there is this real need to listen to each and everything your body says, because losing weight, when you do it, organically that is through workouts i feel your energy would be very much on the positive mm -hmm. and whereas when you're losing weight because of stress i think there's this inherent anxiety within you and somewhere your mind would always be wandering around fear and you might also experience a uh, shallow breathing which is a great sign to look out for so that is indeed a great point and since you mentioned about uh, positive and negative stress, uh, there is a question from one of my connections based in Sydney. Uh, so Zach says, greetings to Professor Pete. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot make it because it is past uh, midnight. So his question is around uh, work. So he says many people right now are really stressed about job and keeping their job safe. Uh, so what he finds is uh, he's, uh, he's taking the stress in a positive way. So it is driving him to perform better, to uh -huh. keep doing what he does best. So he's asking, should he be concerned that the stress is driving him or that he's looking at stress in a different way? That's a very good question. Um, and I appreciate him asking that. It goes back to the positive and negative stress, as you said, Shreyas. It's, um, he's already done a really good approach by thinking, okay, I'm not going to wallow in the negative stress because whenever you're worried about your job, you know, as we talked earlier about, um, being things that we can control and what we can't control. The fact of the matter is as an employee, you can't control if the company la lets you go. And what you can think about is, okay, what can I control? And so he mentions this about uh, going ahead and working hard. What I would say is take a look and say, are you working hard because you're fearful of losing your job? Because that is the issue. And so if you have fear about losing your job, or let's say fearful about looking for a new job, something like that, where it's going to stretch you. What I always like to, to remind people about is that fear, I, I consider fear a, a four letter acronym that, you know, actually Shreyas, you and I had um, uh, uh, posted about earlier, that it's fictional evidence appearing real. What, ha what I like to, 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 to remind people about is that our fear is often based on things we don't know. We're worried about it, there may not be that outcome. And instead, so for, for, for um, your friend or anybody listening here, whenever you're fearful about something going to happen in the future, or maybe you want to try something, but you're not sure you can do it well, or <clears throat> maybe you want to apply to a job that may or may not be uh, as a complete fit based on your skill set or maybe your experience, whatever it happens to be. The powerful question to ask yourself is, what would I do if I knew I couldn't fail? I'll repeat that again. What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Because instead of being in that stuck state of fear, that's driving, you know, may or may not drive you. Now, all of a sudden, you've got the world of possibilities opening up. So, for example, if you're working hard and you want to just make sure to stick to the job, think about that. What would it, what would that look like if you continue to work well? Well, guess what? The company would 
be stupid to let you go. If you are being um, a productive, effective employee and you continuing to stick to the grindstone is like we'd like to say, um, and getting the job done, if the company lays you off at that point, then they don't deserve you. It's just that simple. So you have to look at it and say, okay, what would I do if I knew I couldn't fail? Well, maybe I, maybe a promotion might be in order, a raise, um, certainly job security, because again, unless they've completely run out of money, they're not going to let go of the employees who are effectively contributing. It's just not, they're not going to do it. And I think um, it, it does seem very funny once you realize that the evidences that were in front of you were really fictional because it just doesn't make sense when you're worrying about the unknown and it is called the unknown because you really don't know what it is yet. You start justifying that it is very real and that might become true eventually. So you, do, you just... Uh, offered a great advice where you, know, you need to understand the surroundings, the situation, what conditions you can control, and what is just beyond you. It, you can't help it, and the outcome is totally not um, under your direct influence. So understanding that key thing is uh, very much important. Uh, and as you mentioned about the acronym of FEAR, I'm very curious and want to understand what makes these evidences look so real and true? Well, it's it's because, you know, inside of us, there's this um, worry that we're not good enough. That's the problem. We think that, oh, we, you know, maybe, you know, we have a job that we don't think that we're really good enough for, and then that's that classic imposter syndrome. Or, you know, we look at a particular opportunity to grow and our inner critic comes in and says, oh, are you sure that, you know, I don't know if you can do that. The thing is, our inner critic is actually trying to help. It's trying to help because it doesn't want us to fail. So what's the easiest thing for our inner critic to do? Don't do it. Because if you don't do it, you won't fail, right? But that's where it comes back to looking at it from a different standpoint. And that question, what would I do if I knew I couldn't fail? That opens the door for visualization. And as we talked about uh, on the podcast, visualization is an incredibly powerful tool because as we start to visualize our success and whatever that is, whether it's in our job, in a relationship, our health, then that starts setting the bar in our mind about what we want to achieve. Um, and so it's, 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 it really is mindfulness um, and not doubting that you can get to where you want to be, but you have to believe in yourself. That is, you know, and, and a lot of times there's people, you know, that'll have a lot of confidence issues or self-esteem issues that are things that unfortunately happen maybe as kids uh, uh, or adults where, you know, we had some sort of um, event or somebody who was very influential on us telling us we weren't good enough. Um, and those are kind of things that you have to work through. And if you build up success on even in small steps and you start moving forward to it, then you can start building that momentum. But you can, you know, you have to be willing to try. Yeah, I think it's also important that when we're facing something that we might be afraid of failure is to remind ourselves what we are naturally good at, what skills do we have, what talents mm -hmm. do we have that we can use to be successful. Because mm -hmm. you're right, there, not only um, do we have our own self-critic, but a lot of times growing up, we have family, friends, colleagues, bosses, all telling us what we can't do instead mm -hmm. of encouraging what we can do. So I think it's really important when we're in that situation is to take a moment and remember exactly what our strengths are and how we can accomplish that. Yeah, it's a great point, Michelle. And, and you know, the interesting thing is, is that if you look at your skills, the things that you really are good at, that didn't happen overnight. <laughs> it just didn't. You had to have worked at it at some point. There, you know, it's we're not born with, you know, perfectly 
great job skills, let's say. There's some sort of learning that we had. And so if you if that inner critic is creeping in and you say, you look at what is it that I'm good at and stuff, well, if you think back about when did you first realize that you were good at that, it was probably because you started working on it and all of a sudden you had these little successes along the way. And each success builds your confidence. Boom, boom, boom. I literally, I had a career for 20 years in the medical device industry because I knew medical devices and how to digitally market them. And that was something, you know, most of my peers were terrified of that because here in the US, if you work for a medical device company, a publicly traded medical device company, you have to follow very, very strict guidelines from both the uh, FDA and the FTC. And so you could easily get fired if something is communicated incorrectly, even slightly. And so, you know, I just found a niche. And as I continued to try different things and pushing the envelope much more than anyone else, I just thought, okay, I'm going to try this. If it if it uh, fails, okay. The fact of the matter is, and this I, I've learned over the years as well, it's not necessarily failure. If you think about something not working, it's actually just feedback. It's you know, it's the universe telling you that didn't work. Try something else. And so, if you can think about that from the mindset as well, you are successful at your skills. You were able to get be, become proficient at certain things. Well, you must have had some failures along the way. You figured that out and you continue to find your way where you get to hone your skills. That's feedback. It's not failure. It's just telling you, try something else. Yeah, I agree that failures are really, um, they could be just a first attempt in learning. Mm -hmm. It could be an opportunity to try something different. Failures are very important in our whole lifelong learning process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I, I, for one, have learned way more from my perceived failures than I have from my successes. And in fact, um, you know, there's there, I know that there's been groups that have been created at least pre COVID um, where they were celebrating failures. So like on a monthly basis, they would get together for a cocktail hour and people would come and say, okay, what was my biggest failure from the last month? And people would celebrate it because the fact of the matter is, if we're stretching ourselves and we're going in uncharted waters that we've never been in, you know, it's not going to be completely smooth. You know, it's all about thinking about, all right, what am I going to learn? What am I going to get this feedback from that tells me, okay, I got to try something slightly different because I've never been on this, this, this far stretched uh, at once. And I, and especially for me, I remember uh, because I was focusing so much on technology during my career, my goodness, when, when something would crash, uh, like I remember having a webinar and, and um, the audio for whatever reason didn't work and people were all complaining. It's like, what am I supposed to do? I mean, I, I'm, it's not my, you know, it's not my software and stuff, but I tried to do everything I could. The reality is, did anybody die? <laughs> no. Um, but you take, you know, we take that on and, and it's like, oh, it just burns inside of us. And it's just, don't, don't be afraid to try something new. Don't be afraid. It's going to give you some sort of feedback. And that is the learning. That's the great learning. If you try something, it works great. Keep doing it. If it doesn't work, okay. So, what didn't work about it? Did you do you need to tweak it a little bit? That's that's the fun about figuring it out. I really love the point where you mentioned about celebrating the failures as well, and I think mm -hmm. science will really back it up because when you celebrate, you're automatically instructing your brain to release the feel good hormones which in turn optimizes your body functions. Mm -hmm. So that will eventually, you know, just care, give you a big boost of energy, big motivation, and even sometimes inspiration as well. So celebration, or for that matter, doing something that will make you feel good. 
I think is a great way to start beating stress. And if I could just take a moment, I want to highlight four things that um, I uh, remember when I listened to the conversation about uh, FEAR, the acronym. So there are four things that might uh, really limit us. One is the gremlins. So it is that inner critique which keeps on telling you that you're not good enough because it is providing that false sense of security. In some cases, it is also trying to protect you from taking responsibility to negative life events mm -hmm. or negative situations. So that is a very, I would say it is deep rooted. So you might not be very aware at the outset that you have a gremlin voice within you. Mm -hmm. The second that you clearly mentioned was assumptions. So assuming that a particular event might not go through because you don't know what the outcome is. So you start making uh, false realities. You start assuming things. So again, that will really pull you down and add to the stress. The third is interpretations. So the moment you don't know something, you don't know about what the outcome will be, you start filling in your interpretations in the void that is created. So again, that will definitely impact the levels of stress you experience. And sometimes it just gets logarithmically exponentially more because you don't know you have absolutely zero control. So you start moving towards that self-destruction. And finally, I think this is something which we all would have faced at some point or the other, which is limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. So setting some beliefs based on the conditions you have been accustomed to based on the teachings that whatever you have read or what has been taught to you, you might create a belief system which might not hold any truth mm -hmm. either for you or for people around you. And again, when you start questioning that belief system and when you don't know how to get out of it and you know avoid uh, uh, rather than avoiding, I would say embracing it and making that positive change, I think that will again impact the levels of stress you face. I just wanted mm -hmm. to add that to the beautiful um, suggestions you mentioned a little while earlier. And I, and I totally, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, uh, I would ask the next question. So please. Oh, okay. And and what I you know it, it's interesting, Shreyas, because it's a it's a great list that you have there, and you know the limiting beliefs is a really hard one. It really is because it's learned behaviors that we've had, um, because it's what our perception of the world is, and um, the one of the things that helped me with that is. Um, respecting others' perception of the world. Because we can be very judgmental about, oh, that person doesn't agree with me, so they must be wrong. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And the th fact of the matter is you don't have to agree with someone, but you don't have to criticize them about their belief if it doesn't fit with yours. And that alone can have a huge, huge um, uh, benefit on your overall stress. The other one that you mentioned, I, I, um, that I, kind of focus for me, the victim men mentality. When, you know, we've all had people in our lives who are, they always say, oh, it's somebody else's fault. This always happens negatively to me. You know, the, the reality is we control our lives. We control our lives. No one else stresses us out unless we allow them to stress us out. And if we continue to just point the finger at somebody else and not take responsibility for ourselves, you're going to, that, 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 that mentality is going to keep you really down. And I'm a huge believer that if you can continue or change your mindset to be a positive mindset and continue to put positive out there, you will attract back that positive. Same thing happens if you are projecting negative thoughts. You are going to bring back, you're going to attract back negative thoughts. And a great example of that is if we're, let's say we're running late for a meeting or work or whatever it happens to be. And what happens? So let's say you have to drive to work. And first of all, A, you can't find your car keys. 
Or, <laughs> or you get in the car and guess what? Every you're going to get behind somebody who's driving slow. You're going to hit every red light. It, you're going to have traffic and it's not moving. Whatever it happens to be, because you're manifesting that negative energy about, oh, I'm going to be late instead of just saying, okay, it's, you know, I'm just going to get there when I can and not worry about it. And also have gratitude if something good happens. Like, for example, I just, an automatic for me, whether I'm heading for work or going anywhere, it, there's, uh, I live nearby where there's a drawbridge. And if the drawbridge has to go up, guaranteed, that's a 45 minute delay because the cars all back up. So every time I cross that bridge, I say, thank you for an open bridge because I'm sending that out to the universe, positive energy, instead of, you know, instead of saying something like, oh, I'm so glad that the bridge is not closed. Well, the universe does not know positive and negative. It only knows whatever your statement is. So if, if I was to say, oh, I'm so glad that the, the bridge is not closed, well, it's saying, the universe says, oh, you want the bridge closed next time you come? So it's all about the mindset. And if you can keep, you know, do whatever you can to be positive, you'll see some really positive outcomes. I totally agree. From what I hear you say, it is like attracts like. Yes. And as you clearly said, the universe doesn't distinguish. I think perhaps uh, the only unbiased entity that we can think of will be the universe. So mm -hmm. whatever you put into it, you reap the benefits or you reap uh, the negative outcomes because yes. of the words you phrase. So indirectly, really words to have the power to make an impact. So it can either make you or break you depending on how you choose to use it. And the uh, example that you gave is a great uh, way to show how uh, you know things might be different if just by changing the words. In, in reality, the meaning might be same for us linguistically it might not change but when you talk about the energy levels the uh, various other elements in play i think that really makes a very big difference uh, and thanks for highlighting that so we come to the exciting part uh, which i think everyone is waiting for one small tool from you uh, that uh, you'd like to share for the benefit of our audience Sure. Um, some small tool. Let's see. Because uh, uh, we did visualization last time. Um, well, you know, so <clears throat> uh, we have, do we have 10 minutes left roughly? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So a really powerful tool um, that can really help you with your stress is understanding what your personal values are in a particular area of your life. So um, let's take your career. Um, what happens is a lot of times we are not happy in our careers because we don't feel like it's a, a good fit for whatever reason. Well, a lot of people don't take the time to understand what are, what is important to you and your personal values are what's important to you how you spend your time and how you evaluate the use of your time. So what anyone can do, and it doesn't take very long, is they elicit their personal values. So if you imagine, like for the two of you, go ahead and close your eyes. And I want you to think about three times as it relates to your career. The first time, I want you to think of a time when you were most happy in your career, most happy, what were you doing? Who were you with? What was the event? The second time, as it relates to your career, when was the time you were most proud in your career, most proud. Who were you with? What were you doing? 
What was the event? And finally, think of a time in your career when you were most fulfilled, most fulfilled, F-U-L-F-I-L-L-E-D. Who were you with? What were you doing? What was the event? Now open your eyes. And I'd like you to write down, if you have a piece of paper handy and a pen, I want you guys to write down as many one and two word answers to the following question. What's important to you about your career? What's important to you about your career? As many one and two word answers to that question. And what else is important to you about your career? And what else is important to you about your career? Now that you have this list, what I want you guys to do is rank them from most important, number number one, just put a number next to it, to the least important, whichever one would be the last one on, uh, you know, on your list. And Judette, I can uh, provide a link to this activity. Um, it's, uh, I have a blog post on it. Great idea. So go ahead and rank them from one to whatever you have. And once you have those ranked, what I want you to do is create a new list with on a separate piece of paper potentially, or at least separate from your current list and put value one at one line, value two on the second line, value three on the third line, value four on the fourth line, and value five on the fifth line. And Shreyas, I put the link to this activity. Um, I couldn't put it in the comments section. So if you if you can, com, uh, copy and paste it so whoever's here, they can use this. Um, so now, the, now that you have that list of your top five values as it relates to your career, what I want you to do is keep that piece of paper handy. Take a picture of it with your phone, put it in your purse, put it in your wallet, whatever you have to do. Because the next time that you have an important decision to make 
as it relates to your career. Make sure that decision is in alignment with your top five values. Because if that decision is not in alignment with those top five values, I absolutely guarantee you are going to create unnecessary stress in your life because you are not being true to yourself. Your personal values are who you are, what's important to you, who, what, how you are true to yourself. And when you go against that, it's going, you're, you're not going to feel right. It's going to create that stress that you do not need. And uh, you know the link there that I uh, that Trace will share or Michelle, if you can, with the with everybody. Um, this activity can be done for your career, your relationships, your personal health, um, your spirituality, um, relationships outside of your you know so the special someone that you might have in your life, whatever it is. And you might have different values for the different areas of your life, but knowing what those are is so important because over time, chances are four out of the five of your top five values will not change in that particular area of your life. First of all, Professor Pete, thank you for sharing this valuable tool. I think when we do it at our own pace, uh, in our own time. I think this is a really great tool to understand what values and belief systems holds true to you. And mm -hmm. I think this is a great uh, tool to let go of those limiting beliefs we were just talking earlier, because now you have something that is that gives you happiness because of what we did in the initial phase where we closed our eyes and thought about what is the career we want, what made us happy. So I think we are considering all the positives and then coming up with this values. So I think this is a great way to let go of, I think even the gremlins and the assumptions as well. And if we start working on these values, I'm sure given some time, we might be able to let go of our interpretations and start noticing that positive changes um, and I think it is really valuable and as good as any other assessment out there. Mm -hmm. Michelle, what do you feel? Mm -hmm. And it's, yep. oh, go ahead, Michelle. Oh, it's okay. Um, yeah, I agree that we need to take a look at what's important to us and focus on that. Um, it's an aligned with also with Clifton Strengths and working with your innate talents. Mm -hmm. That if you're not utilizing what's innately strong about you, that you will not be happy. So that's right in line with that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's kind of reminds me too, like, um, the Ikagi, Ikagi, I always have trouble with that word <laughs> and, you know, which is this Venn diagram and you're trying to, you know, these circles and you're trying to get in the center of that circle. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the career, often the, those three circles are what you love to do, what you're good at mm -hmm. and what, what pays you reasonably to do it. And if you right. can find the center for that, it's it's happy. But you have to know what your, your your values are as it relates to your career. It's not just about a paycheck. It, I guarantee you, if you do this and you take the time to uh, process this in your mind, it you know money will be there somewhere. But it chances are it's not going to be a paycheck. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't take the time to really think about what's true to them, what their values are. They're so worried about following what they're told to do, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What they're told to believe that people really don't think about what is within them and mm -hmm. what makes them happy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's it, it true. You're, and you're, you know, we were talking about before about stress inside of our bodies and stuff like that. Your body, your mind and your body will tell you if you're not being true to yourself. We all know that. And so this is a good barometer check. And it provides a great uh, validation as well, because some of us might be predominantly left brain oriented. So we need some actionable proof. And I think this is what uh, will hold true for both. Either you just follow a tool you know, without any questions or you're that left brain people like me who start looking at proofs, how to get validation. So I think this self validates what you feel and in turn provides you the motivation and inspiration required to make that uh, positive change.
Mm-hmm. And I totally agree with you that your personal values define who you are, and that will start establishing your brand identity as well. And this still for sure will help you understand the top three brand values. So this is a great tool to use for that as well. Uh, so finally, Professor Pete, we have had an hour long discussion, very insightful, full of value, full of words. And this tool, I'll just start using it to probably identify what my coaching niche is. I do have one, but I think this will validate if that niche is really valid for me or not. Um, so finally, the one question we ask all our guests, if I were to ask you your legacy, how would you describe it? He, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I would say he made a positive difference in this world. That's the legacy I want. That is, that is really a great one. And it feels empowering, not just for you, for those around you as well to know that someone they know has made a positive impact. And I think that will be a great motivation for our audience as well. And this is the segment that will interest you perhaps, which is now you get to take um, the lead and ask either Michelle or myself any question that you may have and get back at us for putting you through the hot seat. For a while. <laughs> so um, I'm curious, uh, the question I would have since the, the Valleys exercise, uh, you, you know, Shreyas, you mentioned it, that it's really powerful for you and, and Michelle, you as well. But, you know, can you see this working as a uh, tool that not only just for your careers, but for other areas of your life? Is that something that you could, uh, you know, you could apply it to? Michelle, would you like to answer first? Oh, that sounds like a cop out. Okay. First of all, <laughs> I want to say that I don't think we put Professor Pete on the hot seat. I think he enjoys sharing and giving and he did a wonderful job. Mm, thank so you. I'm going to say that. Um, absolutely. I think that's a tool that uh, not only we can use in our regular life, that we might even use it as much as on a daily basis to help us mm-hmm. determine what we are doing and what choices we are making. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. referring referring to sorry sorry to interrupt. Um, referring to your values list on a daily basis. In fact, you know that list. You could stick it on on you know the bottom of your monitor to be a uh, uh, thank you, Carmen. Um, that uh, would allow you to to continuously remind yourself of it. It's it's really really good. Shreyas, you were going to say sorry. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so for me, I think uh, this tool will definitely, as a coach, I can start using it uh, with my clients, with your permission. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so now I have something that I can use uh, and validate what Michelle will tell me in our coaching sessions. <laughs> That's all we have in the first, you know, because she is my Clifton Strengths coach. So now I have a way of getting back at her and challenging whatever she says from now on. So it won't be a straightforward coaching session, I'd say. Uh, But jokes apart, I think this really will help me uh, both with my other career that I'd be starting very soon, which is me as an automotive engineer in a totally different country. Uh, And given the current uh, challenging situation, I think we have to redefine what novel means. Mm -hmm. And also there is this... uh, big challenge for me in terms of language, adaptation to the environment, my social factors, because obviously when English is not a typical language that is used, they will start, uh, there will be some social influences going on. And I think this tool will really help me address my social, mental, emotional, physical, environmental um, influences very easily from now on. Mm-hmm. So that is my biggest takeaway from this. Great. Well, thank you for that. That was my primary question for you because I always like to 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 get feedback on on uh, the different tools that I recommend. So, Michelle, closing thoughts. 
Well, again, I just wanted to say thank you, Professor Pete, for providing such value to everyone. And I'm sure many more people will watch it on the replay on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And Shreyas will be also uploading it to his YouTube. So should get some um, good exposure to be able to help lots of people. So I just want to say thank you. My pleasure. It's been it's, uh, it's always it's always a joy to to, to get on on uh, you know one of these calls with you guys and you do great work. Uh, Thanks, Professor Pete. I'd like to take this opportunity and uh, to thank you for sharing this amazing tool, and I think it will benefit those that have listened live. I think you would have got a feel as to what this tool can really do for you. If you are watching the replay, then please do pause the video and take as much time as you want. Go to this tool, work it out in one field, see how it feels, and please do share your feedback with Professor Pete because he is constantly working towards developing and improving the tool to be uh, to make it uh, in sync with the changing times. Mm -hmm. uh, and Professor Pete, I also want to extend an invitation to our finale episode, which will happen in two weeks. So if you can make some time and just join us for closing season one on a great and positive note. And for me to take a break off social media as I make uh, my moves, I would be really honored. Rather, we would be really honored to have you among a panel of guests to celebrate uh, what has been a great season and also to celebrate you who have made us feel very special by honoring our invitation and sharing your knowledge with us. So on that note, I'd like to also thank our lovely audience, Carmen, Judith, uh, Alison, and others for showing up and supporting us all along our journey. So thank you one and all. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your week.